everyone my name is Tamara Nambia and I will be introducing Deepika Patkone. As a celebrity the choices she made every day was subjected to public controversy and criticism. Nonetheless she always managed to stay strong and poised. Her formula was be authentic be yourself. Deepika I have a few questions for you. When I grow up, I want to become an artist, a scientist, and a singer. When I read your story, you were a great badminton player but chose to become an actor. How did you choose from an actor and a badminton player? You know the same way that you want to be an artist and a scientist? How do you feel? You can achieve both, right? You feel like if you set your heart on something, you can do that. And then you want to do something else and you can do that too. Um, so honestly, when I was growing up, I was, even before I realized, I started playing professional badminton. But it's when I was a teenager, I realized that maybe this is not something that I want to continue and pursue and play professionally. And every time I watched a movie, somehow I felt like that's where I belonged. So it's my gut that told me that I wanted to transition from being an athlete to being an actor. And then I followed my gut. You know what gut is? Like your instinct, like that voice inside you that tells you what is right and what is wrong, that. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> How are you? Thank you. Uh, next, can we have uh, Anuradha Pal, uh, the role model, and the question that's going to be posed to her uh, is by Anya. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anya Abraham, and I've written for this book. Today, I have the honor of introducing Anuradha Pal. Um, her chosen journey was filled with roadblocks. She encountered discrimination for being a woman, trying to master a masculine instrument, skepticism for being young, and resistance for not hailing from a musical family. But Anuradha was not deterred. She was relentless with her discipline, training, and confidence. And I truly admire that. I have a question for Ms. Anuradha Pal. <laughs> that was deliberate. <laughs> well, um, you know, when I, um, the one most important thing that I learned uh, since there's a paucity of time, I'm going straight to the point. When I went through all the discrimination, the one thing I learned was 
not to listen to that negativity, to focus on my goal, to focus on what I wanted to do, what my heart was telling me to do. And I knew that ultimately my passion will let, you know, will do the talking. And um, so when I went through that journey, I was dismissed at every point, I was discriminated, but uh, my parents egged me on, though I don't come from a musician family, they were kind enough to en encourage that passion. And um, uh, also, my gurus, Ustad Lalarka and Zakir Hussain, set such exacting standards, and they basically uh, were so uncompromising. I'll tell you a little short, you know, an incident. I was uh, just 15 years old uh, when uh, Ustad Zakir Hussain asked me to accompany him on a concert tour. And um, so he, um, <clears throat> we were traveling and at the moment I, I was so excited, uh, you know, he called me at night and he said, what are you doing in the morning? And I said, what am I doing? Getting up in the morning. So, <laughs> so he said, meet me at the airport. And I went to the airport and, um, and he had a flight ticket for him, for Jaipur. And he said, go off to sleep. I said, but I'm so excited, I'm traveling with you. So he said, well, just go to sleep. And the first thing I learned was, he said, you're gonna travel all your life, you're gonna need rest. The moment you need, you have a mom opportunity, go to sleep. <laughs> okay, then I reached there and uh, we did this grueling tour. I was uh, put through a, a drill of lots of practice and all that. Of course, earlier I had gone through 10 hours of uh, Chilla, which is called 10 hours of practice every day for 40 days, uh, which I followed as a routine from the time I was in school. Uh, because I wanted to ramp up before I learn from such great gurus. And uh, so when I went on with uh, Zakir Bhai, he tells me that, you know, uh, tomorrow you, you're going to play a concert with, uh, you play the concert and I'm going back to Bombay. And uh, I said, but uh, there are going to be eggs on my face, <laughs> you know, if I play instead of you. So he said, okay, stay up all night. And there was a Kathak dancer. And he said, sit up all night and practice with her. And I did. In this little room, we were, I was locked up in this little room with no guidance from the master, nothing, no word. And I, all I had to do was learn from the beginning, whatever I had to do. The next day I performed, um, you know, we, I kept practicing and he, he kept saying he's leaving, but he didn't. Finally, in the evening, when, when uh, it was time for the performance, he says, you know what, you're not playing with the dancer, but you're playing with me. I said, oh wow, great. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know a whole night I was practicing with the dancer, but that's fine. So when I get to, get to the stage, he's, I said, so what are you going to play? So he said, what's your age? I said, I'm 15. So, okay, so we'll play 15 beats. I said, no, 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 no. I'm 16, because 16 beats is a little easier to play. <laughs> so he said, no, now the damage is done. You said you're 15, play it. And I was put right into the drill. I had never learned that, that tal in my life, but I was put straight into the thing, and I played. By God's blessing, I somehow managed. But I was, there was a, there was one point where I think I didn't do as well as he expected. Obviously, I was so scared. So he put me through a huge punishment. And the punishment was go up and down all the stairs and all the things. You know, anyway, it was a very bad punishment. So, so that was one, one uh, thing that I learned, how to be quick-witted that day. I learned to be quick-witted, how to be adapting to the situation. and. It helped me when I play with all the great masters now that I play with since I've been 13, I've been playing uh, with all the great masters, been performing since I was 10, but that helped me a lot. So I think putting yourself to that grill and making sure that you actually surrender to learning uh, does help. Uh, also, I think, uh, of course, there were many incidences like that sometimes, you know, and through my college days, I mean, I was doing crazy things. I had a very, very crazy schedule when I was in school. By the way, to answer your question. Uh, I used to get up at five, practice, go to school, 
come back at 3.30. From 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, do my homework and studies. No time to play, no time to rest, no time to do anything. 6 o'clock, leave for my gurus, 7 to 10. They're all the way from Juhu to Nepensi Road. Travel and come. And till 11 o'clock at night, go back to, Bom to my house. Again, the next day, the same drill. So I think all these things, so I, I, I personally believe that hard work and really, really focusing and being determined about what you want to achieve is really, really important and is the driving force. What also, um, so I mean, when you, when you say what, how did I manage my time? Yes, the most important thing I would say if I learned from my father uh, was uh, how to multitask how to uh, completely um, be focused and disciplined about everything, orderliness, timeliness, punctuality, uh, being able to do many things. So I think all these things really, really matter. And incidentally, last, uh, you know, just to tell you on a very, in a very personal, on a very personal note, uh, you know, uh, it was, it was, you know, 2017 was a very bad year because I lost five family members. And in 2016, when my father got an epileptic seizure, it was just three hours before a major concert that I had. And when I was winning him into the ICU, he kept saying, go to your concert, focus on your goal, okay? 2017, when he passed away, three days after that, my, I had a concert right here at the, uh, Sophia's, Sophia Hall, and Sophia Baba Hall, and my mother came to encourage me in the concert. Three days after, last night I had to take my mother to the ICU. I just was up all night in the hospital, looking after her, and I've just come straight from the hospital here. And the only thing she told me yesterday is you're not gonna break your commitment. You're gonna stand by what you did, and that is the true meaning of being a professional. These days, people think being a professional is about how you earn money. I don't think so. I think it's about how, you, how committed and dedicated you are to whatever your art is, or whatever your passion is. And it's about making sure that you stand by your word and become a person of character. And that's what I truly believe is important to be able to achieve one's goals. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha, and uh, we wish your mom uh, all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, for the next role model, let's have Moksha come up here, and she's going to pose her question uh, to Brinda Somaya. Hi everyone, my name is Moksha Davalor. I'm 12 years old and I have the honor of introducing our guest, Ms. Brinda Somaya. So here are a couple excerpts from her story in the book. Brinda Somaya is an architect. She designs buildings. Brinda is also an urban conservationist. She protects the spaces around the new structures that she builds. In 2001, Brinda turned her attention to Badali a little village in Gujarat that was demolished by an earthquake. Was it possible to rebuild the village exactly the way it was before the disaster? Yes, it was. Brinda did just that. So I had the honor and the opportunity to write Ms. Somaya's story. And despite all my research, uh, we came up with a couple questions for her. The first one being, I live in the US and I know you studied there. So what made you decide to move back to India and to set up your architectural firm here? And secondly, what made you decide to work publicly and volunteer to build and restore public spaces? Well, I was just waiting outside and one of the gentlemen there told me that I'm well dotted. So <laughs> it's great to be here and I would like to first congratulate the three women, Lakshmi, Reema and uh, Sharda for bringing out a book for children, because this is something we all want to do and need to do desperately. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a different generation from some of the young ladies sitting here. Um, I was in America those days, it was the 70s and 80s, 
And uh, many people who went there at that time never returned. A lot of my classmates, a lot of young people, we all know that. Um, I remember studying there and one summer I was at Cornell Summer School where I now happen to be a professor. And I spent the whole afternoon with a whole lot of Indian professors and their wives having lunch. And they spent the whole hour or two talking about India. And I saw myself maybe 20 years from then doing the same thing. And that's not what I wanted to do. I certainly did not want to be peripheral to any society in which I lived. So I had actually got admission to another master's degree. I went home. I mean, I went back to my university and I called my mother and said, I'm coming home. And no regrets because I think to live and work to live and work in a country as rich in its culture, in its diversity, in its language, in its food, in its art and its culture, and feel that, that you are part of it. To me, that's the most important thing. And that's why I came home. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and to round up the panel, uh, can I have uh, Kavya come up here and uh, pose a question to, uh, uh, who are we posing the question to? Dr. Seema Rao. Dr. Seema Rao, please. Thank you. Namaste to everyone. I'm Kavya Davlor and I'm here to introduce Dr. Seema Rao. Seema Rao, first Indian woman commando trainer. Thank you, thank you. Here is a passage from her story in the book. As a child, Seema was bullied. She would cringe with a mixture of helplessness and revolt, hoping for a strength that would put her on par with the bullies. Years later, after she became a medical doctor and married, her husband introduced her to martial arts. She embraced it and began her transformation from weakness to strength. Dr. Seema Rao, I have two questions for you. Yes, what are they? <laughs> Number one, I'm eight years old and I've seen many kids being bullied. Okay. I've also experienced it myself. From your story, I know that you were bullied. Can you tell me and all the other kids out there about it? Question number two. Yeah. Okay, uh, first and foremost, let me say that I'm extremely uh, happy to be here with you wonderful people and uh, Otherwise, my life is all about commando training. Uh, I'm India's first and only woman commando trainer. Yes, I train men, commandos, and <laughs> thank you. And I go to the nook and corner of uh, the country. I go to ice-clad mountains, scorching hot deserts, and uh, you know, dense jungles, and I train the commandos. So uh, if you look at me, you'll wonder how, uh, you know, I reached commando training. Well, it was not my life's design to be there. Uh, you know, we all believe in destiny, so that's why destiny had something else in mind for me. So I started off as a doctor, but ended up uh, training commandos of the Indian forces. Uh, I'm going to talk about my childhood because I think, uh, you know, certain incidents in our life change the way we think and change what we want to become. Uh, one of the incidents was way back in school. What's your age? Eight. Eight. I must have been about eight or nine years old when there was an incident in school that, uh, you know, changed me. There were these, uh, you know, girls in our uh, class and they were, uh, you know, ones who had failed the class. So they were about two years elder to all of us. So one day, what those girls did is they, uh, you know, lit some firecrackers under the desk, and one of the girls' uniform caught fire. And everybody ran helter-skelter, and there was only this girl whose uniform caught fire, and obviously she was hospitalized. 
And uh, everybody was asked in the class that who was responsible for this. Uh, nobody owned up. Uh, now, you know, the thing is that uh, I, I am also the daughter of a freedom fighter. I was very close to my father. So I think a certain degree of righteousness is, uh, you know, what I had inside me, which I realized when, when this incident happened and, you know, I realized that I was the only one to, to tell, uh, you know, the, the staff, the teachers, that it was these girls who were responsible for that incident. Nobody else said anything, but I was the only one. I was afraid, there's no doubt about that. But somewhere I thought it was just unjust. And I thought that, you know, people who are responsible for doing harm to somebody else should be taken to task. So um, that was what happened then. And uh, of course, I paid the price for that because, uh, you know, uh, about a few days later, my exams were around the corner. Those girls were taken to task and they were uh, punished. So they had to get back. So one day when the school uh, left and we were all leaving the classroom, I was the last one to get out. And uh, these girls cornered me in the corridor. They caught hold of my hands. They pulled my bag. They removed my journal and they tore it to pieces in front of my eyes. Now, you know, when you're the studious type and you see your journal being torn and the exam around the corner and you know that it's going to cost you your marks. So I looked at them with disbelief, tears in my eyes, and I couldn't do anything about that. And I still remember that helplessness that I felt uh, at that time. Years later, I would like to tell you about another incident, but this was, uh, you know, when I was uh, about 17 or 18 years old. So um, I met this young doctor male, he was into martial art, and then that's when I realized that if I had to change from weakness to strength, then this was one way I could do that. So I started learning from him, and there was this incident uh, which again changed me forever. Uh, we used to live in Chopati, very close by, so we used to go to the beach and we used to practice martial art. Uh, let me say that we are a very, very uh, bonded couple. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, in the, in the forces, people call us the ideal buddy pair. Uh, the ideal buddy pair is a concept where two people are that close that I can trust my back and that nobody is going to shoot from there because of him and the same with him. So uh, coming back to the story, so we were training over there on the beach and uh, it was about uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. It was a hot, sunny day. And the beach was getting empty. It was time for us to go back. When suddenly there were a group of these, uh, you know, uh, rack pickers who were passing by. And uh, they happened to look down and uh, see what we were doing. And they started passing lewd, demeaning remarks at me. We decided to just ignore them, continue with the training. And once we got off, they were standing at a distance and we had to pass by from that route. So my husband said that, uh, okay, now that those guys are there, uh, you know, you're going to have to face them. And saying this, he moved out of that place. Uh, I think that was very important. I thank him for that because I, I think that day I decided or I learned to fight my own battles. As I walked towards them, I was very scared. So I decided that maybe I'll just walk across and finish with the whole thing. And suddenly one of the guys came and stood in front of me. I was looking down and he was in front of me. I moved to the left, he moved in front of me. I moved to the right, he moved in front of me again. So he was obstructing my path. I was looking down and I was very scared. And slowly I looked up at him. And what kids' minds are, and uh, what I'd love to do next is to stitch that up with a, with a personal favorite story of mine. And I hope uh, this dazzles you as much as it dazzled me, and then we can get into a discussion with you guys as to what you think, how fair or unfair the world has been. Um, I do want to start with a disclaimer that I, I, my job in this panel is to bring the law of averages of some power hitting women out here down a bit, because that's what I do. Um, but quick show of hands, um, has anyone heard of Henrietta Living? Henrietta Living? The genome that was supposed to cure something. Close. She was an astrophysicist. Slightly different stream, but uh, there you go. Uh, getting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can combine this by the end of the evening. 
So the, the story of Henry Till Living is, is a remarkable one for the simple reason that most folks don't know who she is. And her contribution to the world and the universe is remarkable. So here's what she did. Um, Henry Till Living in the late 1800s was hired by Dr. Pickering at Harvard. And there was a team of 80 women that he put together. And they were known as the human computer. And what these people did um, was fascinating. They looked at photographic evidence of what's called uh, Cepheid stars. So they just st stared up in the sky, looked at stars, kept plotting it on a piece of glass year after year after year for at least 11 years from what I remember. And then these women literally computed manually by hand the, the rate of the flicker, extrapolated it to the movement of the stars, and that led to Hubble looking at these things together, and he said, wait a minute, over the last 20 years, these stars have moved apart, which means that the universe is expanding. And the inverse of that is that if it's expanding, and if you, if you contract it, it all started with a bang. That led to the Big Bang. And this was 80 women who worked on this, got zero credit, and the fact that nobody here can name any of them is testimony to the fact that Women don't get as much credit as they probably do. I'm going to make the story a little worse. Uh, the nickname for these women was Pickering's Harem. Pickering, uh, Dr. Pickering is the guy who picked them, um, but these women were known as uh, Pickering's Harem. So on that note, uh, in your own streams, uh, clearly I'm sure you've dealt with issues where you've been looked down or up uh, purely on account of your gender. Right. I would love to hear your stories of what you had to go through, and it would be great if you can have one personal anecdote of a gender bias, and how do, you, how do you fight it? It's one thing to read about this in the newspapers, but what would be remarkable is if that's something you can touch upon at a personal level um, that we can relate to. Yeah. Any order? Okay. Um, I don't think necessarily that it's always connected, necessarily, always connected with your profession. There are some issues that women have and will always have. And um, I think uh, we have to under, uh, not accept it, but be proud of it, uh, live with it, see how we can work with it. And um, in 2000, I, I organized a conference for women in architecture. And uh, 10 years before that, I had tried to organize one when I said I wanted women's work to have an exhibition, but it should be their work. It should not be women who had worked with uh, their fathers or their brothers or their husbands, because that's what happens in architecture. The women always pushed back. <coughs> and I didn't get any response. But 10 years later, in 2000, when I sent out the same thing, but I made one difference. I said, even if you work with your father, brother, or husband, if the work is yours, you can participate and take part in this exhibition. And things had changed hugely. So change is always happening. Um, and I always look at it as a celebration and not to make excuses. Um, you know, I've been working now 40 years and I never thought that I'm in a man's profession all the time or that it's a struggle. I think one accepted certain issues and uh, worked within those constraints, because we have advantages too. We have, it's not that we don't have advantages being women, but I know it's not easy. But I do want to say one thing that bothered me. I was on a committee in Delhi, in the Paryavaran Bhavan, which is the Ministry of Environment, and I was on that committee. And I would be, uh, I had to fly to Delhi and reach the Paryavaran Bhavan before 10 o'clock and get up at five o'clock in the morning uh, to catch the flight. And I would reach there and I would ask, well, where's the women's toilet? And there wasn't a single toilet in that whole building, except in one corner, there was a filthy toilet which was locked up. So this indifference to women's needs is not just at a high level, it works right down. A few years later, um, I had studied at Smith College and I got a doctorate there. And one of the other women who was given an honorary doctorate was the first woman at the American Stock Exchange in New York. And she said when she began work, there wasn't even a toilet in the entire building for women. And she had to go out of the building and go to the next building. 
So there are many, many issues that we have to overcome, but we're strong. And I think if we love what we do with a passion, we keep our integrity and our value systems intact, uh, we will shine always. Well, mine is, a, you know, physical. I have to say that I've never really experienced it, but maybe now when I think about it, maybe it's the way that I was brought up. It never, it never sort of, uh, I didn't look at it through that lens ever. So maybe there have been instances where there I have faced that sort of discrimination of male versus female, girl, boy. Mm -hmm but maybe I just didn't register it because that's not the way. Um, I've grown up in a family, there's just me and my sister, we're two girls, and we were never made to feel like we cannot accomplish something because we're girls. Um, I started playing badminton at a very young age. Um, girls and boys traveled together, we played together, we stayed in dormitories together. We had the same issues of like not having toilets uh, or not having, uh, you know, water to shower or... So the issues in that sense have been the same. Again, maybe if I think of it, maybe the prize money that the guys got was a little more than what the girls get. Today in film, uh, there's no lack of opportunity. Uh, sure, in the kind of films that we've made, maybe say a couple of years ago, um, and, and the place of a woman in a film, versus how those roles have changed today are very different. Um, and of course the pay, which is again something that, uh, you know, I'd like to speak for myself and say that for myself, I think I've been able to bridge that gap in terms of what my contemporary, male contemporaries are getting versus what I'm getting paid. There was a, a, a recent incident where an act, where a director offered us a film and said, you know, Creatively, I liked it, uh, and then it came to sort of talking about the monies, and I said, okay, so this is what I would charge, and it kind of went back and forth where he came back and said, you know, actually, we won't be able to afford this because we have to accommodate the male, uh, you know. So I said, okay, then, Tata, goodbye, because I know my track record, I know what I'm worth, I know that his films haven't been doing as well as my films have been doing, um, so, it made absolutely no sense. So I was okay to say no to that film based on that one thing because I just thought it was unfair. And I'm ready today to take those uh, steps or measures or uh, decisions for myself because I'm going to be able to sleep peacefully at night. I don't think I'd be able to live with that sort of thought knowing that I've been a part of a film, had the same sort of creative contribution uh, or bringing the same sort of value to a film, but being underpaid. I was not okay with that. So I think some of those instances, but I think broadly, I've never been made to feel less or not being able to achieve something because of being a woman. If I may just say one thing here, since Deepika said that, we did a survey of uh, women and successful women. And I, I also have just one sister, which is two, two girls in the family. And strangely enough, they found where they were only daughters, uh, the confidence level was different uh, than when there were sons as well in those families, at least maybe yeah. a generation before. Think, yeah. 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 So that's interesting. That's a, that's a great insight. Uh, before we go to other people, there's a, there's a beautiful research by, I'm sorry, there's a beautiful research by Gina Davis uh, about the, uh, the uh, I forget what the, uh, the technical term is, the extras in the movie over a span of about 800 Hollywood films, turns out that 90% of the background extras are male. So the, uh, you know, to your point of subconscious conditioning as to what one sees on screen and what was, goes on literally in the background, I, mean, it, I thought it was a remarkable statistic which just goes unnoticed. What about you, Aditi? I'm going to tell you about discrimination. Friends, <laughs> it is so annoying. Uh, no, you know, I tell you, I, I think it ties in with the, yes, yes, <laughs> um, you know, it ties in with what we are sitting here today for is that uh, stand-up comedy to a very large extent is storytelling, is, is telling the truth about your life and telling sometimes an exaggerated truth about your life. 
and I realized that, um, you know, when it came to lineups and stuff, people would be like, oh my God, you're really funny for a woman. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but it makes you realize that women have to work triply hard for someone to be interested in their story. Like, I, I know that like one uh, a fellow comic once came and told me, Tere ko pata hai na, tere set mein sab sutta marne jate hai. And I was like, really? What do I have to do? What do I have to do to follow up that guy before me who did like a round of terrible jokes, which everyone was like, haan, sachi, correct, aurat bahut time lagati kapde penne mein. So correct this man is. Telling some real truths of life out here. And then you go on stage and you're sort of, you're definitely saying things that people have never heard before. And actually that was one of the reasons I got into stand up was because I was like, I don't, I can't identify a narrative of where the woman is funny and not hideous. Like, you know, like otherwise they would be like, Are, why? And I was like, Q, Q, why can't we be owners of our own stories and why can't we take the center stage not as an object of attraction. I know that like corporate gigs, uh, I still get like, Are, female comedian, shakal kaisi hai? I was like, koi nahi poochra jokes kaise? Koi nahi poochra? And then, I, and then, and honestly, I mean, I, I would like to say, Dipika, that I would have totally been like a Dipika Padukone myself. <laughs> but I like to eat. <laughs> me too! I, oops, I shouldn't be saying me too, but... Uh, <laughs> I just asked for samosas and they had none. I, I will see you backstage yeah. by the snack plate. With the chutney, mixing with the sweet chutney. Oh, yeah. Oh. Where is this? Oh. Should they just bring these on? Yeah. No, no. Okay, no, no. Let's flip it around so that uh, Deepika doesn't get enough time to think this time. Um, <laughs> and we'll keep it. I'm very curious to see what yeah, these little chits are. <laughs> By the way, you guys are being judged. These are on a score of 1 to 10. Is your wife saying you're terribly boring? Yeah, like pretty, uh, <laughs> that, that I'm very used to. <laughs> the, the secret to my marriage is success, which is 17 years. Uh, by just the way. say yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just say yes. Great conversation. You know this mantra that all you men think like works. <laughs> it's not my, a secret my, my anymore. My parents the solution for this. My mom and dad are somewhere here. And I remember once I heard them argue when I was 10 or 12. And uh, mom, dad told my mom that, hey, listen, um, we're going to solve all the big problems. You guys can solve all the small issues, right? All the fiscal issues, the monetary issues, kids, tuition, education, etc." So my mom asked him, what the hell are you going to solve? <laughs> and he said, well, us guys will get together and solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, the cure to cancer, <laughs> which is what men do. They get together, have a couple of beers, talk philosophy. It's the Parisian attitude. <laughs> you guys do the heavy lifting yeah. and get paid less, clearly. <laughs> yeah. well, let's flip it around. So, uh, one of my favorite comedians, uh, Chris Rock, you know, made this comment that we live in a time and age. I thought he was going to say you. Yeah, I know. I was yeah. going to be like, count out. This, this me. This after me. this, you, you might bump it up a notch and get up to be. Oh my God. Yeah. So work here also. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and like, no, impress and no pay. me. <laughs> so Chris Rock said, uh, <clears throat> we live in a time and age where we are, everything is so politically sensitive that the gig for a stand up comedian is borderline pushing the envelope between the last bastion of free speech, right? And maintaining that professional ethic. And I can s clearly see how lines can get blurred and things get taken out of context, et cetera. What, what's your stance on this, being in the profession? You know, I think actually political correctness is not the biggest danger to comedy. I think that, in fact, we have lived in a world where um, easy laughs have been derived from too much cruelty. And the fact that we are pushing back you know, the fact that the world is pushing back and saying this is not okay, that you can't, like if you're, if you're hurting somebody, um, you're perpetuating a very harmful stereotype, be better. Mm. And uh, I mean, of course, we're all going to make mistakes on the way. We're all going to do terrible things. And where I have said several and done several politically incorrect things that I sorely regret right now. But having said that, you know, the push towards political correctness as the bastion of free speech I, I really don't think it's a problem. And, and the truth is that because a lot of the narrative has been largely male. A lot of the narrative has been ki aurat ko time lagta hai kapde penne mein, usko driving nahi aata hai, oh no, wow. 
I'm like, you know, in Saudi Arabia, women are not allowed to drive. So give us some time. Nobody's like, are mardo ko saadi ni penni aati. Give them some time to learn. So, so it's sort of, it, you know, I, I think that, uh, in fact, if anything, um, you know, not, not maybe curtailing voices, but giving mics to, or giving stories yeah. to people whose stories have not been heard before is going to actually lead us to a more inclusive and empathetic world. And women will actually feel, because I mean, I don't know, maybe we, like women are more, somebody told me this recently, ki, Aditi, yaar, you know, sometimes you're a lot more cruel in real life than you are on stage. And I was like, you know what, it's true, because I, I feel terrified to sometimes say some really, really cruel, funny things, which I know my male friends will like gas off with confidence and someone's like throw money at them or whatever. Um, but so I, I think that when you hear more empathetic stories, when you hear more kind and more inclusive stories, you just have a more empathetic, inclusive, and kind world. Yeah. Thanks for that. <clears throat> uh, Deepika has got to run after this. We'll continue the panel, but let, let me pose a question to you. And a fellow venture capitalist recently wrote about, uh, I don't know if you guys have read this article about the return of investment on any movie that has been made in 2018 over a budget of 50 crores. Have you read about this? Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, so every, every movie, this is the last question for Deepika. I'm getting all these cues. Um, in 2018, all Guys, the movies- Guys, like, are we under attack or something? Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what I feel like. Samosa uh, tayar hai. <laughs> <laughs> so all movies made over a budget of 50 crores. Over. Over, in 2018. Uh, there are many data points that were remarkable, including the extremely poor ROI on all movies made by the cons, but leave that aside. <laughs> the, uh, I had to slip it in there. Uh, the top five movies, purely in terms of return on investments, have, off the top five, four have been women-centric themes. That's, I mean, that, that, that's saying something. Um, and do you think this trend will continue, being in the industry? And I think, I think it's, pretty awesome that someone ran this analysis. Um, so, just to give you numbers, so uh, the return on investments on real estate in India was about 7%. The cons returned 9%. Uh, Women-centric movies, the top four out of the 10, out of the five, sorry, returned well north of 25%. Um, yeah, which is remarkable. Um, be happy to share this link with you guys, but, uh, but, but what do you think of this? I think it's amazing, and I think, look, I think, I think it's, it's nice for us to say women-centric or female-centric at, say, at, uh, you know, at a moment like this when we're talking about female role models. Having said that, when it comes to creativity, we need to look beyond female or male. It's about the film. If the film didn't work, you know, it's okay, it's a different thing that the, the you know, the, the films that the Khans did didn't work. But say there was a film like Andhadun that was led by Ayushman. Um, so I think that it really boils down to the script itself. But yes, I see a trend which is films that, you're right, films that are being led by women, um, are doing much better. Also, we're in a place today where directors are changing roles. And that's unheard of. You have, you know, if you have a script that sort of has a male protagonist, and suddenly directors are like, one second, let me just flip that. Let me just make that a female protagonist and then go to so-and-so with the film. So you hear of a film that was offered to a male actor like two, three years ago, and it's coming back to you now with a female protagonist, is a huge achievement, you know. Um, but as a creative person, I would not like to make this distinction of like, you know, male-led and female-led and all of that. I would just say that I think great content is what is really working right now. And I think a lot of that has to go to the audience. They're ready for that. I don't think it matters today anymore who is in the movie. It really depends on the kind of story that's being told, um, uh, you know, how well the director is telling that story, uh, you know. So there's a lot of these factors also, I think, that are playing a very, very important role in, uh, 
you know, in the success of these films. Okay. You know, it's not, it, I, I don't think you can blindly say, okay, so-and-so's in the film, so let's go and watch it. I think 2018 was a clear yeah. sort of, um, Watershed, yeah. you know, on that, yeah. you know. Um, so you have to sort of, the pro, right from the promo, the posters, all of that, I think that the audience has that pulse. I think they know instantly from the minute that first trailer goes out, they know at that very moment whether they want to watch that film or not. Of course, there are films that may not be sort of trending right from the start, but then they release on that weekend and there's that word of mouth that sort of, you know, helps elevate the film. Um, but yes, I think gone are the days when you just had like a big star on a film poster and that film worked. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if you're going to, uh, are you going to kidnap her? Yeah, you're going to kidnap Deepika? Okay. I don't need my samosas. <laughs> <laughs> what, So we're going to unveil the book at this point before Deepika leaves and then get back to the panel. Uh, so let's, let's have you guys steal the show. And I'm going to step away for a second. नहीं, I think I think जैसे दीपिका ने कहा that we came from a family जहाँ पर girl and boy में कोई difference नहीं किया गया था. My parents were very supportive जब मैंने कहा कि मुझे actor बनना है. In fact, my mother gave up her job ताकि वो मेरे साथ एक जगह से दूसरी जगह तक जा सके. Of course, protective थे because ये industry उनको मालूम नहीं थी. तो मुझे अकेले मुझे अभी भी याद है first meeting पे जाना था तो mom and dad both went and took me for the first meeting of my modeling assignment. But मैं lucky थी that my parents were very very supportive. Um, but having said that, we can't ignore this fact that in the world there is a difference in the world. And I think what we are constantly working towards as women who are in a position to is bridge that gap. So we are constantly working towards that gap. 
इम्पॉर्टेंट पर्सनैलिटीज चाहे वो एक्टर्स हों या स्पोर्ट्स में हों या राइटर्स हों आई थिंक देयर एजेंडा इज़ टू गिव अक्रॉस द पावर वुमन डेफिनेशन एंड या ईच वन ऑफ आस ट्राइंग टू डू दैट स्टार्टिंग विद दे दे प्यार दे 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 प्यार दे आएगी और अभी मर जावा की शूटिंग चल रही है सो मर जावा विल बी समवेयर इन अक्टूबर एंड बाकी आई विल अनाउंस समथिंग सून अगेन दिस सम इंटरेस्टिंग टॉक्स और तमिल में तीन रिलीजेज हैं अभी फेबररी में एक रिलीज़ है एंड देन अप्रैल में एक रिलीज़ है एंड एंड ऑफ द ईयर अन अदर वन एंड तेलुगू विल ऑल्सो हैव टू फिल्म हेलो क्या स्क्रिप्ट होगी जी इट्स अ रॉम कॉम लव रंजन आफ्टर सोनू की टी टू यू नो इज इज प्रोड्यूसिंग दिस फिल्म एंड अकी सर ने डायरेक्ट की है इट्स अ वेरी न्यू एज रोमांटिक कॉमेडी मैं ज़्यादा डिटेल्स नहीं बता सकती अभी बट ऑल आई कैन टेल यू इज दैट इट्स गोइंग टू बी अ रोल इट्स गोइंग टू बी एन अमेजिंग फिल्म फॉर एवरी फैमिली लाइक एवरी एज ग्रुप टू वॉच तबू मैम है उसमें अजय सर है एंड मैं हूँ अभी वो स्टोरी क्या है मैं नहीं बता सकती बट बहुत ही इंटरेस्टिंग है एंड आई एम श्योर बी वी लाइक इट श्रीदेवी जी जी फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑलरेडी रिलीज हो गया है जो अभी अभी रिलीज हुआ है लास्ट वीक जनवरी में एंड इट्स गॉट अ वेरी वेरी गुड रिस्पॉन्स बट बिकॉज माइन इज अ स्पेशल अपेरेंस तो वो दोनों पार्ट्स में यू नो दो तीन सीन इधर हैं और थोड़ा बहुत सो इट्स स्प्लिट बिटवीन बोथ द पार्ट्स एंड वी गॉट अ वेरी गुड रिस्पॉन्स एंड फर्स्ट फेब को सेकेंड पार्ट रिलीज होगा जी श्रीदेवी बंगलो सी आई डोंट नो द डिटेल्स ऑफ इट मैंने भी वही पढ़ा है जो ऑनलाइन ट्विटर पे आता है और आई डोंट थिंक आई शुड कमेंट ऑन इट कि अभी उसमें राइट्स थे या नहीं थे आप मेरे को उतनी डिटेल्स मालूम नहीं है सो आई आई नॉट लाइक टू कमेंट ऑन दैट जो मैं हर साल करती हूँ काम और बहुत सारा काम एंड आई जस्ट होप दैट लोगों को वो काम पसंद आए Thank you. Thank you.